What's up guys, Nathan here. This past Monday, GGG announced the details of the upcoming flashback race slated to take place during the last month of Synthesis. And while some players are less than satisfied at the lack of juice present in the flashback mods, I still think it's a great opportunity to try out a couple of new builds, engage with old league mechanics, and get some practice in before 3.7. In case you don't know what flashback is, here's a quick summary. It's a one month league running parallel to and sharing challenges with Synthesis where every area will have three additional past league mods active. Every hour, these mods will rotate randomly, meaning if, for example, Blood Aqueducts had Parandis, Harbinger, and Breach active, it might switch to Invasion, Rogue Exiles, and Abyss. If you want to learn more about this event, I'll be linking the official forum post below, so check it out if you're interested in detailed rules, FAQs, or how to compete for rewards. Anyway, let's talk about today's video. Unlike regular leagues, flashback events are not accompanied by new skills, items, or most importantly, balance changes. This means that overpowered builds and mechanics from Synthesis will remain completely untouched, allowing for savvy players to start exploiting them from day one. The purpose of this video is to go over some of these mechanics with the intention of preparing you guys to have as much crucial information as possible before you start flashback. I'll be talking about all kinds of things, such as specific skills, ascendancies, and items, so if you want to learn more, please check out the links in the description below. But without further ado, let's jump into the video. Winter Orb This should be a no-brainer for most of you, but in case you're living under a rock, Winter Orb is probably the most overpowered skill in the game. It's time to stop! It can be played as pretty much any ascendancy, can be built for all types of content, and is viable on any budget. To go into a little more detail, the main reason why Winter Orb is so strong is because it can pretty much do everything for you. It lets you move and deal damage at the same time, can off-screen packs of enemies, has shotgunning AoEs for single target, and requires zero aiming from the player. Put simply, there is no content in the game the skill can't be built to excel at, and the player doesn't even need to know what they're doing. Just hold down right click for half a second and start running in circles until everything is dead. There are two major arguments for playing Winter Orb during flashback. First of all, like I said, I personally believe it's the best skill in the game right now, so making a Winter Orb character is probably the safest choice you can make in terms of being ready to tackle all content. Secondly, I seriously think and hope Winter Orb is going to be nerfed into the ground in 3.7, so if you haven't played it yet, now might be your last chance for a while. As far as specific builds are concerned, I'm going to recommend three solid ascendancies. Trickster, Elementalist, and Occultist. Trickster is probably the most versatile and all content viable, but it also has the highest potential single target damage when built correctly. Elementalist is also an excellent choice, but it leans more towards speed mapping and low tier magic find. Occultist would probably be my last pick, but it's still a fantastically tanky option with access to more than enough damage to do all content in the game. I'll be linking a few guides that fit these ascendancies in the description below, but if you really want to be on the cutting edge, I recommend checking out poe.ninja slash builds to see what people are playing right now. Just don't get carried away with sorting by DPS. Any build using GMP and doing at least 200k will be more than enough. Trickster Another mechanic that shouldn't surprise you is the entire ascendancy known as Trickster. I know most people don't usually talk about the power level of builds with such a specific focus on ascendancy choice, but hear me out. First of all, we have Swift Killer. Assuming you're playing a channeling skill, this is basically 40% increased damage, 16% increased attack and cast speed, 16% more damage, and 160% increased critical strike chance. And as good as this sounds on paper, it's also important to note that literally all of these stats are exactly what you need to make pretty much any crit based channeling skill feel good to play. Next, we have Ghost Dance and Escape Artist. Not only do these two nodes work together to provide powerful and flexible defensive benefits for evasion, CI, and hybrid builds, but they can also provide 10% increased movement speed, stun immunity, 20% spell dodge, and up to 36% increased attack and cast speed. 
When compared to the defensive nodes available to other ascendancies, such as Occultist, Jug, or Gladiator, Trickster may have slightly less raw survivability, but it more than makes up for this by providing easier access to a large number of defensive layers. Lastly, let's take a look at Patient Reaper and Harness the Void. Patient Reaper is kind of the iconic Trickster node, and I personally think it's one of the most satisfying effects in the game. Dropping dangerously low to a rippy pack of monsters while mapping, only to watch your EH pool instantly shoot up to full upon getting off a cast of Soul Rend or Essence Drain, has to be one of the best feelings in the game. Harness the Void, on the other hand, isn't all that overpowered on its own, but it allows for game-breaking abuse of Eternity Shroud, which is a unique I'll get to later. Trickster's other two nodes, Prolonged Pain and Weave the Arcane, are still pretty decent for a number of builds, but I wouldn't consider them to be that standout in the grand scheme of things. Overall, I think Trickster is the best ascendancy option for some of the best skills in the game, so when you're choosing your starter for flashback, make sure you consider some builds that utilize it. Herald of Agony when creating a Path of Exile build, your general goals are going to be to invest in damage, survivability, and utility. This is done via your gear choices, your skill gems, and of course your skill tree. For most builds, this means making some hard decisions, usually sacrificing one or two of these benefits for another. However, for whatever reason, this doesn't really apply to Herald of Agony. Let me give you an example. If I load into Path of Building right now, make absolutely zero choices on the skill tree or with my gear, then simply cobble together a 6-link Herald of Agony setup, we're instantly looking at 327k DPS at max virulent stacks. For reference, if I did this with Winter Orb, I'd have a little over 8k DPS. <gasps> the point is, Herald of Agony requires so little investment to do endgame content, I can't help but rave about it. And although you can push its damage far higher with some actual investment in gem levels, the real strength of this skill is the amazing flexibility it offers to builds that want to use it as their primary source of damage. For example, you could play Herald of Agony Juggernaut. This build can get crazy high regen, armor, and of course endurance charges. Its sustain and immunities to slows make it an excellent bosser, especially if you're interested in killing Uber Elder as early in the league as possible. You could also go Gladiator, which is a personal favorite of mine. Rather than focusing on high sustain, this build zooms through maps with Cyclone, relying on life gain on hit and max block to stay alive. However, while this build is on average tankier than the Jug, its relatively small life pool and lack of defensive layers makes it more prone to unlucky one-shots. The last build I'm going to recommend is Occultist, which also happens to be the most popular choice. It has slightly less raw defenses when compared to Jug or Gladiator, but has higher potential boss damage and Profane Bloom explosions to help with clearing. This is probably the most balanced and highest scaling Herald of Agony build, so definitely check it out if you can't decide which Ascendancy to go for. The last point I'd like to make about Herald of Agony is that it's stupidly cheap. This of course goes back to just how little investment is required to reach acceptable levels of DPS, but regardless, this quality still makes Herald of Agony one of the best league starters you should be considering for flashback. Eternity Shroud On the complete opposite end of the cost spectrum, we have the Eternity Shroud. Most of you probably know this is the single highest DPS item you can put in your chest slot for any non-dot elemental build. However, after talking to some players in my Discord, I think there are some misconceptions about just how overpowered this item really is. The first and probably least obvious benefit provided by this item is its defensive qualities. Not only does it provide up to 100 life, but it also provides up to 1100 evasion and almost 200 energy shield, which are overall very respectable stats for a unique chest focused primarily on offense. Furthermore, it grants up to 23% chaos resistance and a passive called Glimpse of Eternity, which creates a slowing bubble around you when you're hit. Put all these factors together and you get a chest with a number of flexible defensive bonuses, especially for hybrid builds. The next two mods are the ones pretty much everyone notices right away. Gain up to 5% of elemental damage as extra chaos damage per shaper item equipped, and... Hits ignore enemy monster chaos resistance if all equipped items are shaper items. 
This means up to 50% of elemental damage gained as extra chaos, as well as the bit about ignoring chaos resistance, which is actually pretty relevant against endgame bosses. For reference, this is roughly three times better than a perfectly rolled at series promise for pure elemental builds. On the surface, most people see this as just another damage steroid for hit-based elemental builds. However, if you dig a little deeper, especially by doing some reading on the wiki about how damage conversion works, it starts to become clear how overpowered this item is. For starters, every time you convert from one element to another, you gain Eternity Shroud's extra chaos damage all over again. Next, you can factor in sources of extra chaos damage, such as Shaper Scepters, Etsiri's Promise, and Trickster's Harness the Void. Lastly, throw in some Wither Totems, and you've got yourself a recipe for a build that can one-shot Shaper with pretty much any applicable skill in the game. For the last part of this Eternity Shroud Circle Jerk, I want to talk a little bit about how you can take advantage of this item's existence. For one, you can play a build that actually uses an Eternity Shroud to great effect. This includes Ascendancy such as Trickster and Elementalist, along with skills such as Divine Ire, Stormbrand, and Stormburst. Winter Orb Trickster is of course the most popular option right now, but I personally think this has more to do with the individual strength of those two mechanics rather than the Eternity Shroud itself. You can also try to be one of the first people to acquire an Eternity Shroud, which will of course lead to massive profits upon selling. Because it drops from Uber Elder, this would mean League starting as a boss killer and selling carries early on in the League, so I highly recommend considering the pros and cons of doing so. Chaos and Cold Dot Skills Switching gears again, I want to talk about a couple of build archetypes that I consider to be Tier 1 starters. Chaos and Cold Damage Over Time Builds while they don't have the same clear speed or upper damage scaling as skills like Winter Orb, they make up for it by being dirt cheap. The first of the two is the Chaos Dot build. This can include skills like Essence Strain, Contagion, Soul Rend, Bane, Wither, and Blight. The general idea is to use one of these as your primary clearing skill and then supplement it with a couple of single target supports. The finalized damage of a build like this usually caps out somewhere between 2 and 4 million Shaper DPS, making it more than enough to do all content in the game while playing solo. As far as specific builds are concerned, there are literally dozens of viable skill combinations. Soul Rend Trickster, Essence Strain Trickster or Occultist, and Pure Bane Occultist are some of my favorites. Generally speaking, I think Soul Rend Trickster is probably the most balanced and fun to play, but you really can't go wrong. The second of the two archetypes is the Cold Dot build. These generally consist of a combination of Vortex and Cold Snap and are usually played as either Occultist or Trickster. The main advantage of Cold Dot skills, aside from being able to achieve millions of DPS on a relatively low budget, is the fact that they can chill and freeze everything, making for an impressively defensive character. The number one way I'm going to recommend you play a Cold Dot build is to make a Vortex Occultist and either go Low Life or CI. This means massive energy shield totals, huge amounts of cold damage, and passively freezing nearby enemies. Plus, all of these factors put together make for an amazing boss killer, so be sure to consider this build if that's what you're interested in doing. Synthesized Items Out of all of the tips I've given you today, this is probably the most time sensitive. Chris Wilson recently announced Synthesis will not be going core, so if you're interested in getting your hands on some cool synthesized items, now is the perfect time to do so. Some of the more popular Synthesis implicits include Onslaught Boots, Increased Level of Socketed Gems Bows, and Enemy Exploding Weapons. Even if you don't care about getting rich in Standard via Legacy Gear, there are still a number of reasons to chase down these synthesized items. For example, if you are playing a skill that scales heavily off gem levels such as Dot Skills, Herald of Agony, or Blade Vortex, Socketed Gems Bows are probably the number one best way to increase your DPS. If you want to go fast, Onslaught Boots are setting a new standard for the amount of movement speed you can get in that slot. For builds that lack strong movement skills or rely on Phase Run or Queen of the Forest to get around, a pair of these boots can completely revamp your mapping experience. If you're looking to play a physical based build with okay clear speed but want to take things to the next level, look no further than one of the new enemy exploding weapon implicits. 
I personally haven't used one myself, but I'll be linking an excellent cute dog video below where he talks about the surprisingly impactful benefits of using one of these weapons. So now that I've hopefully managed to sell you on how fantastic these items are, let me explain how you should go about interacting with them. First of all, consider setting up a live search to snipe the necessary components to synthesize the items you want. You can do this by using PoEDB to figure out what you need and pathofexile.com trade to keep tabs on the market. I'm not going to go into detail about how to pick out the proper fractured items or how to synthesize them, but I'll be sure to link a guide or two in the description below. Next, you should be engaging with the memory nexus. This means acquiring high-level memories, seeking out juicy reward nodes, and even setting up some blocking. This is actually just good general advice for playing modern PoE, but if you specifically want to get your hands on some top-tier fractured bases, you'll want to engage with synthesis as often and as efficiently as possible. Lastly, keep an eye out for off-meta synthesis mods. While the options I talked about today are undoubtedly some of the most popular ones, there are still dozens of equally if not more powerful implicits you could be trying to synthesize. Spend some time on PoEDB, figure out what mods you want to chase, and get to work. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Do keep in mind there are plenty of other individually powerful mechanics in the game right now, such as Vol skills, energy shield builds, and occultist, but I didn't want to make a 30 minute video. Personally, I plan on starting as a Stormburst, Divine Ire, or maybe Incinerate Trickster, quickly finishing my Atlas, then focusing on engaging with Synthesis Crafting as much as possible before it's removed from the game. Thanks for watching, this has been Nathan, and I'll see you next week. Thank you! What's up guys, thanks for hanging around to the end of the video. I want to thank all my Patreon supporters, and we have a couple to get through today, so I'm just going to get started. Thank you so much, Real Human, Pete, Zikarak, Squally, Zuljan, Coda, Julia, Alan, Keplerk, and brand new, we have Fusk, Putzak, and Oro or Ori. I may or may not have said that last one correctly, but uh, uh, they were very specific in our messages about how I should say it, so I hope I didn't fuck that up. Uh, anyway, if anyone else is interested in joining the Patreon party, family, team, whatever you want to call it, you can check me out at patreon.com slash NathanBrotherBob. Um, you can also check out my Instagram that my girlfriend is keeping updated for me on a relatively sort of regular basis, and that's at NathanWalkerYT. And then you can also go join my Discord, which is in the bottom right-hand corner there where I hang out and uh, other friends of the channels hang out and, you know, for Patreon, non-Patreon people, just... Just a good, good group of people that play Path of Exile. Or don't play Path of Exile. I don't even care. Anyway, thank you for hanging around, and I'll see you next week. Oh, and good luck in flashback.